Thank you. When Netflix makes The Crown about the Aspen Institute, it'll be about Linda. Uh, <laughs> she is sort of the godmother of this place, uh, has been guiding us and hosting us and welcoming us for since I've been coming here. And it's a great pleasure to be here. I've been swept up in Linda's aura, uh, as Walter and I joke. Uh, Walter was the first to make this observation. Uh, Linda has a thing for uh, Jewish men under five foot seven. <laughs> And so the original Linda man is Stuart. <laughs> then the, there's been a succession of short Jewish men. Uh, Michael Sandel, Tom Friedman, Walter, me, I think Jeffrey Goldberg. If Pete Buttigieg were Jewish, we'd be screwed. Uh, <laughs> um, so anyway, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, first, the business side of Linda. She's managed and founded um, with Stuart some amazing brands, Teleflora, Franklin Mint, Palm Wonderful. Fiji water, every pistachio you've ever eaten, uh, landmark wines, a whole bunch of great minds have come out of their joint uh, work. Um, some of you may know uh, that Linda was inst instrumental in the publication of the Pentagon Papers. Uh, we can talk about that. It's, uh, and uh, what you may not know is, or some of you probably do know this, the most emotionally intelligent person I've ever met in my life. Uh, when I went through a tough time um, six years ago now, Linda would look at my smile on the news hour and send me a text and judge ex accurately how I was doing that week. <laughs> so if you ever want long distance psycho psychoanalysis, uh, this is your person. <laughs> so before we get to our subject, we are going to watch a short video uh, about uh, Linda's work in the Central Valley, and then we will talk. <laughs> The Central Valley is the salad bowl of America. Healthy choices are literally sprouting from the ground, and yet the region suffers from the worst wellness crisis in California. Four thousand of our employees and their families live and work here in the Central Valley. These are the people who make us successful. Helping them live longer, healthier lives isn't just a business imperative, it's a moral obligation. A few years ago, we discovered that half of our employees were pre-diabetic. And without intervention, 87% would develop pre or full diabetes by the time they reached their 50s. We had to act, so we approached the issue like we approach every business problem. We started with research. In speaking with our employees and their families, it was clear no one had the proper tools and care they needed to make wellness a priority in their lives. If we were to really make a difference, we had to apply the model of whole person care. And in 2015, we opened up two wonderful wellness centers, one in Lost Hills and the other in Delano. Our centers are staffed with compassionate bilingual doctors, nurses, nutritionists, health coaches, physical therapists, sleep experts, and behavioral health specialists. We offer top-notch primary care for all wonderful employees and their families. We provide urgent care, annual checkups, immunizations, and even nutrition counseling. We treat chronic conditions like diabetes, obesity, and high blood pressure. We help with stress reduction and mental health issues. We even have an on-site pharmacy, and it's all free to our patients, even the prescriptions. We assigned a personal health coach to assist in addressing the specific individual needs of that patient. I guide them along the process and give them the tools so that when the health coach isn't there, they're still able to continue on living healthy lives even after they leave the clinic. I was made aware that I was diabetic. My health coach kind of explained to me what I needed to do. We put a plan together and I was able to drop my numbers by like three points. I make sure my patient's needs are met no matter what it takes. So if they can't make it a Zumba class, Zumba class comes to them. To make health and wellness a part of every workday, we have fully equipped gyms on site. The break rooms are full of free healthy snacks and the cafeterias only serve affordable healthy meals. The mobile clinic provides all the services a basic primary care physician could provide in any other clinic. 
health happens where people eat, where people live, where people play. And so being able to take the mobile clinic to those places brings us closer to where we can impact health. As someone who grew up here, very far from the nearest clinic, I can't explain to you how crucial it is to have these services available. Our 4,000 employees and their families are now visiting wonderful wellness centers 20,000 times a year. But that's not the amazing part. Remember, in 2015, 50% of our employees were pre-diabetic. Today, that number is down to 29%. In just over three years, we've cut the pre-diabetes rate almost in half. That's life-changing. But we knew if we really wanted to change the paradigm of health, our full court press had to start with the youngest members of the community. We brought health and wellness into our own charter schools and made nutrition and exercise a natural part of our curriculum. Kids grow healthy foods in our learning garden, then learn how to cook what they've harvested in our teaching kitchen. And through the Soldiers of Change program, students have become the teachers, spreading the message of health and wellness to their friends and family. We've put full service health centers right inside the schools themselves. Now, when a student needs to see a doctor or nurse, they don't have to miss school and their parents don't have to take time off from work. I can get all my son's school vaccinations done at the wellness center. Research shows that when you have on-campus health centers, you see healthier kids overall, higher attendance rates, and better academic performance. To be successful, students need to be healthy. And the healthy habits these kids learn here are healthy habits they'll use for the rest of their lives. What we've learned in the Central Valley is there isn't one silver bullet to achieving better health outcomes. But by attacking the problem on multiple fronts, with hard work and care, we've made our little corner of California a healthier place. One life, one family, one community at a time. I'm going to ask questions mostly about your philanthropic work, but I wanted to pick up on one thing that's easy to pass over, which was 4,000 employees. Is that how many you have? No, we have 9,000. 9,000 employees. So but 4,000 in the Central Valley. Yeah. People have lost sight of the fact that what, one of the things businesses do is they actually create jobs and prosperity, and it's not just the philanthropy that's important, that both sides are important and good, uh, and some of that has been lost. Now, let me ask you about your philanthropy um, and really how this approach, this uh, way of thinking about what you would do with this part of your life, how it got started? So we wrote checks, like we all do, and I never knew where the money was going. I never got a report afterwards. I was really um, not very sophisticated about being a philanthropist. Um, but 11 years ago at the Aspen Institute, Michael Sandel was our house guest, and we were invited to a dinner party. and. Um, I asked the hostess, do you mind if I bring Michael Sandelli? He has a great lounge act, because he, he runs uh, Justice in Society and Ethics at Harvard. He's one of the most popular um, professors at Harvard. And he asked the students these very uh, deep, uh, soul-searching questions. Um, you've heard some of them. What if a train was coming and there were five people that were going to be hit by that train, but there was an obese man right in front of you and if you pushed him over, you would save five people. Hard question to answer. Or do you believe in stealing? No, of course not. But what if your child was dying and the penicillin was inside the drugstore? Would you break the door down? Well, this was the time when uh, all of the waterboarding was going on. And uh, we were thinking about torture. It was very top of mind that summer. And um, he asked the question, do you believe in torture? And some of the guys did, but most of the women didn't. And um, he gave all sorts of scenarios. And then he finally said, well, what if you lived in the most perfect place in the world, where every family was happy, well-fed, people had jobs, the children were educated, the sun was always shining, the brooks were gurgling, the birds were singing. But you knew that somewhere in this town, there was a small child in a dark, damp basement that was being tortured. But if you told anyone about this or you discussed it, it would all go away. What would you do? 
So at the end of the evening, I was very indignant, and I got into the car with Stuart and, and Michael Sandell, and I said, well, I could never stand to see the child being tortured. And Stuart looked at me, a man of few words, and he said, well, the child is being tortured. What are you doing about it? And that comment from my husband, it still makes me cry, was what changed my life. And so I started searching for a way to give back. And I was at the Aspen Institute, which is a PhD in, philo in uh, philanthropy. If you are a trustee or you come to these sessions, you can learn everything you need to know about giving back. And also, Peggy Clark, at the same time, asked me, could you find a tractor to send to Mozambique? Because I have sugar farmers there, these lady sugar farmers, that's all I had to hear, women sugar farmers can't compete in the marketplace. They need a tractor. I said, Stuart, can we get a tractor to Mozambique? He said, consider it done. <laughs> so that tractor to Mozambique gave me more happiness than any of the checks we'd ever written in philanthropy. And I started to realize that I need to see faces and I need to see people. And I started my quest very slowly and carefully, because what the hell do I know about this subject? And it grew. So what was the next step? How did you get from the tractor in Mozambique? You could, we could be having this conversation in Mozambique. We could. But, well, well how did you get to the Central Valley? The I South got to the Green. Central Valley because um, I started thinking, do I want to work in Africa? Do I want to work in Vietnam? Do I, you know? And then someone said to me, but these are our employees, and they're the working poor. You need to help them first. And so I put, I hired somebody from our, um, from one of the groups in, inside the company to help me with this. And we started going to all the towns near our plants in the Central Valley to find a town that I thought would welcome us. You'd be surprised how many people didn't welcome us. Um, or they'd say, oh, you've been here before, not me, but others have been here and you make all these promises and you never stay. And so we found this little town of Lost Hills that was unincorporated, so I didn't have to deal with the corrupt city government, which, or the corrupt police, or the whatever. And I did research, because that's what I do when we buy a business. I don't know who the consumer is. I've got to find out who they are, what makes them tick. And here am I going in, a rich la a dowager from Beverly Hills. I didn't know what to tell people they needed. I wanted them to tell me. And so we started with focus groups, and then we did house-to-house -house surveys, every single house in Lost Hills. And they came up with a list of things that they wanted. And the first thing they wanted was a basketball court, because the boys in, uh, would leave their lights on in their cars at night so they could play basketball in this broken down court. And we did that, and then we did the park. And then we realized the streets were terrible. There were no sidewalks. And then we realized there were no lights and everyone was sequestered inside their house and afraid of going out at night because the crime was terrible. And then, as time went on, I realized the worst school in Kern County was right in this little town. 10% um, proficiency in math and English when they graduated the eighth grade. So we tried to work with the school for six years. They rejected us over and over again. And we finally have built a charter school in Lost Hills. And then I realized people are sick. They're dying in their 50s. They're on dialysis in their 50s. And the children of these families are driving their aunts and uncles and their parents to the dialysis, to the doctor, which is an hour away. And that led to health and wellness. Okay. Now, you, you know, you've got a school, there, there, you've got a lot of things going on in the health and wellness piece that don't seem obviously health and wellness. You have a preschool, and the, the phrase in the, in, in the video was, I think, whole person. So how did that come about? Was that something you th that, pe that was discovered slowly, or did somebody come in and say, you know, you've got to do the whole, the whole thing? You know, I didn't have a grand plan. Um, Stuart's the planner. I um, am very spontaneous. Um, but I realize now that I have to plan better. So um, it's sort of, I realized what the social determinants of health were slowly, that you can't just do one thing. It's so much better if you possibly can, and we're blessed that we can, slowly do it all. Uh, you want to put up the slide, David? Now, th this isn't my idea. This is the New England Journal of Medicine and many other um, 
reputable people, but really, none of these things in a vacuum solve the total problem. You need strong family ties. I can't read it from here. You need to be educated. Um, you need to have healthy uh, habits. You can't smoke, you can't drink, etc. cetera. Um, you need health, of course, health care. Uh, but all of these things together make for a healthy society. And so I've come to this very slowly over the last 10 years since we started that we're trying in the six cities that we serve in the Central Valley to do as much as we can. Now, did the behaviors, did the people embrace at least the goals of the behaviors immediately? And it was just... Oh, yeah, they just couldn't wait to give up pan dulces in the morning. It was like, <laughs> where do I sign? Yeah, that was great. And the kids throwing their broccoli at us in <laughs> preschool. And um, no, it's, it's not easy. Um, that All of our schools and our plants and our orchards, we only serve healthy food. And it was very hard. I think the hardest thing was taking away the, um, the sports drinks, the um, uh, Red Bull and the, yeah. And of course, the output went down because people weren't <laughs> <laughs> running on all cylinders. Um, and they screamed about their sodas. But we just took it out of the vending machines. You know, we just don't sell anything but healthy drinks at, at the, um, at the plants and in, in the schools. Uh, but if you wanted to bring something, but then you're shamed. <laughs> so <laughs> rethink your drink. And we have constant propaganda. David's been out there. He was nice enough to come to the Valley and see. And we have videos throughout the plants uh, with all of this uh, you know, propaganda on it about, did you know that there were nine teaspoons of sugar in a cup of rice? Did you know that? It's true. Yeah. Your body doesn't know the difference. Um, so we only have cauliflower rice. Yeah. So how, has you, there actually been a, um, a change in people showing up to work? Have you noticed work, worker performance changing and fewer you know, sick that's days? That's a really great question. Um, I don't know. Stuart, do we see more productivity? You should say just yes. It's yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, yeah. a lot of the loyalty. The, the loyalty, yeah, because we educate their kids, and we give them free health care, and so they're grateful. And we also just raise the minimum wage to fifteen dollars an hour. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to ask you, what's the competing wage at other at your competitors? I think it's the... eleven dollars and fifteen cents yeah. is the minimum wage in California. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. How's it been for you? When we went, took that trip out there, we went to the preschool, and what struck me was you knew some of the kids' names. Oh, yeah, of course. So, like, has it been so socially fulfilling for you to, like, you, you, this isn't just helicopter dropping money down. <laughs> no, I'm in the Valley all the time. Um, of course, we have a staff of people that work there, but I always go, and because I want to see how it's working. I mean, you know, you have to keep this sort of thing up. I, uh, I was doing, we, we have constant focus groups about any, we're building houses there now. And so we had to do focus groups on whether they wanted houses. And, you know, we don't assume anything. And I was out there and I went into the bathrooms at the park and they were derelict. I mean, I just hadn't been in the bathrooms in, in a couple of months and they had gone to hell because now everybody that's driving by 46 comes into the park and the wonderful park because it's the nicest place to stop. And so I have to go and kick the tires and talk to the kids. And, you know, um, there's this little boy named Rodolfo who I'm madly in love with. I once told him, I'm going to take you home with me, and he avoided me for six months. <laughs> I mean, there's yeah, a He hasn't seen your home. Man. Yeah, he, no, he hasn't been to Sunset. That's true. <laughs> and, and there's another little girl named Eileen. Well, anyway, Rodolfo was very bad around Christmas. I think it had gone to his head that, you know, I always make such a fuss over him. I try to be nice to all the kids, but anyway. So he said, you know, I know I'm bad. I, I was red this week, and... I know I have to fight to be green, but it's just so hard. And so I said, you, you know, I'm counting on you to do it. And of course, now he's been great. But then as I was leaving, this other little uh, girl that I adore named Eileen uh, was going into the little girl's room. And I said, hi, Eileen, what color are you? 
And she looked at me like I was a low-grade moron. She said, I'm beige. <laughs> <laughs> But this is what makes my life happy. This is the happiest thing I've ever done in my life. Yeah. Your conversational topics shifted in the last six oh, years. I've noticed this when we have dinner or something. It used to be how bad Trump was or something, but now it's uh, shifted over to talk about this. So it, um, how do, I've always wondered how you do recruiting. Because when I've been there and met doctors, they came from some, you know, places like LA and UCLA, and Lost Hills is not Englewood. Very no, good. and we, you know, we struggle to hire teachers. We struggle to hire the right doctors and healthcare professionals. We have teams of people that that's all they work on. We have two people recruiting teachers 24 seven, all through the year. And uh, look, the, the big blessing in my life is Larry Wolk over there. Stand up, Larry. Uh, <laughs> So we've, we've had uh, the, the clinics um, for about three and a half years now, but we were floundering. I mean, we've got great results, but you know, we, our EMR was out of date. We had all sorts of things and not a strong enough hand for hours and the amount of people we see. I mean, we just weren't professional enough. Um, and I met Larry Walk, he was the head of uh, public health for the state of Colorado, the healthiest state in America. And Larry's come to work for us a little over uh, a year ago. And I don't know if there's anything we can't do now. So yeah. yeah. And of course, good attracts better, you know, and that's what happens when you get a, a good mass of strong people. And then for the teachers, we have to give them housing and so forth and so on to attract them to come to the valley. Yeah. One of the keys is that you focused on a place, a geographic place. And actually when we and our Weave team go around the country looking at different communities, one of the super important things is do the owners of the local businesses live in the town? And if they do, then you, it makes a total difference because they're investing in that town. Did you have that geographic focus and do you see other companies or other philanthropists having that kind of geographic focus that you've talked to or learned from? You know, uh, I've been pretty much under the radar. I haven't really... Um, I mean, going to uh, Spotlight Health or uh, whatever we call it now, idea, uh, Health Ideas or whatever. Uh, this <laughs> Resnick time, Health. <laughs> has, has been very nice to interact with other healthcare professionals. Um, but um, I, I want to do it right. Uh, I'm 76 years old. I don't know how long I'll be able to do this. I want to hear, oh, no, that's impossible. <laughs> right. um, I won't even tell you how old Stuart is. <laughs> anyway. And so I, I know if I'm like, my father lived to be 98, and I just found out why. I think I went to some place and found out that he'd never had antibiotics as a child, and therefore his brain matter was really good. Um, and I think if I can do this here in these six cities and do it right and do it all. It's like a Petri dish of a model because we've made mistakes and we've had successes and you just have to test and retest and retest. Then that will be a legacy that others can follow. And I've spent the last year um, making sure that this work is sustainable because we have a 10 and a 20 year plan of, uh, and of course that'll change and it's very elastic and it depends on what happens next. Uh, but if that works out and I'm blessed enough to, uh, to be able to make this happen, I think others can learn from it. I, I don't know personally other people that are doing this kind of work. There's a lot of people that are giving a lot of money to philanthropy but I don't know people that are doing it in a play space like, like we are. I had an opportunity to talk to um, the head of a billion dollar a year fund. And the fellow said to me, God, I really admire your schools. He said, the schools around here are a mess. I said, you give them billion dollars a year away and you haven't looked at the schools <laughs> in your neighborhood? So what I would say to business is, Start in your hometown, look around. There is so much need everywhere, in the big cities, in rural America. 
And you don't have to start big. You can start little like I did. You can put in a basketball court. You can buy the jerseys for the soccer team. Um, you can go to some school board meetings and listen to what they need. The needs are everywhere, and we know the government isn't there for us. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's one of the things I've learned in the last year, that the neighborhood is the unit of change. You used to think the person is the unit of change, but then it's the neighborhood. And Raj Chetty's work is on this, and Eric Kleinenberg, there's a lot of. Um, I'll throw it open to questions. I'll ask one more. Um, I feel like the, uh, the school's piece has been the toughest. Um, why is that? Well, they don't work for us. <laughs> Although they are coming back after they graduate college. Um, it's the toughest because I don't think these people were ever believed in, the people in the valley. They would have school board meetings in the middle of the day in English. Parents were intimidated to go and complain about their child's lack of education. And so our schools have been around for six and a half years now, and you know we're getting kids that are totally uneducated in the sixth grade. And trying to have them make it in high school and the catching up three years at a time. It's really been a struggle. Um, but we are doing extremely well. And uh, we just keep plugging at it. And we also serve 138 public high schools in our cities. And every child whose parents work for us get a college scholarship as long as their uh, grade point average is a 2.8. So, so education, I mean, the education piece came before the health and wellness piece. And it is the toughest thing. But I don't have to tell you, you know how hard education is. You know how tough it is for math and, uh, and literacy in places. And also, to get the parents, so we educate the parents from preschool through. So we have classes for parents all the way through the school process. Because when we first started giving scholarships way before I got involved, parents didn't want their kids to go away. They were scared. They were scared that they wouldn't come back. They were scared that they wouldn't contribute to the family needs. And so it has been an education process. You know, I have a kid that was accepted at Berkeley and he wanted to go to a, the, the local city college. You know, so it's that kind of you know, we take the parents, we go to Harvard, we let them see what Harvard is, you know, so that they're not frightened of, of that transition. But it's a lot of hand-holding and it's a lot of love. And like that. Yeah. I would say, um, I also, I was struck by how many people I met who, who lost 100 pounds or more. Oh, yeah. That, I mean, this is serious weight loss. Um, I may go to Lost Hills. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, let's, uh, people with questions, I assume that I see, it looks like I see some mic runners around the room. So let's start right here in the front. Linda, personal question. Nature or nurture? <laughs> you have this unusual amount of emotional and physical energy. Don't tell us that still winds you up every morning. <laughs> Where did it come from? What is your guess how, how you got yourself into this incredible performance gambit? I, I have no idea, sweetheart. People have always asked me, I think because my mother was so tough. I was always trying to prove myself to her. Mom, are you listening? <laughs> <laughs> I, maybe. <laughs> yeah, right here. yeah, hi. Uh, Rich Besser from the Robert Johnson Foundation. Thanks for sharing your story, Linda. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the business case for what you're doing. You've talked about it from the philanthropic perspective, but for, for others who are in the business sector, is there a business case for the kind of work that you're doing? Yes. Uh, we're just starting to analyze those results. Um, we know that uh, the, the um, insurance claims for those that have visited the clinic are 20% less than those that have not. Um, and of course, we're staving off the really major illnesses. Um, Larry, do we have other stats for? Uh, I think when we started this, our we were 
paying about $60 million a year in health care. And we, uh, we certainly have stopped the rise of that. And in the Valley, have we gone down? Yeah, flat to this point. But we were going up double digit. I mean, it was galloping. So um, it's still new. We still need to reach more people. Um, and now we're finding like pockets. We're, we're very data driven. Um, there is a place in one of the plants uh, where the women have the worst health of anybody that works for us anywhere because they sit all day and they don't exercise and they don't eat properly and so forth. So we're going in and doing full court press in just these pockets. We're, we're doing it in the orchards where the guys have uh, heart issues rather than diabetes. They're younger, but they have high blood pressure and so forth. So we're really fine tuning all of this sort of thing. Yeah. But there is definitely a financial. And Stuart is happy, right, Annie? <laughs> We have, we have to do a little better measurement, but our turnover is extremely low in the Valley, and we're certainly the employer of choice, and every time I go out there, somebody thanks me for their <clears throat> the fact that their <clears throat> child was able to go to college, and they appreciate it. And so I have to believe that that has an impact on our workforce. Uh, in the blue back there. Got somebody coming behind you. Now, do you see any spillover effects to the rest of the community, you know, from your employees? Well, um, yes, and we are now, our big push for the next year is to get to the wives and husbands of our employees. Even though they're covered, they don't necessarily come in. That's why we have the mobile units. And actually, um, our health care costs for the, for the mate who doesn't come in are twice as high as the employee. So our work is definitely to get out more and more to the communities and we are doing that. And there is a spillover. But your Absolutely. six cities are not contiguous, they're, they're no, sort of spread out. they're dotted, but they're close. I mean, in the valley, close is 35 miles. Touching on uh, the, the third rail of, uh, of health and wellness, which is behavior change, where did you encounter the most resistance? Can you, is there a generalization there? Because a lot of people might take offense of you telling me that I'm fat or something like that. Well, we don't exactly say it like that. <laughs> <laughs> Used to be called Fat Hills. <laughs> You know, uh, most of the people that come to us come because they have a cold or an allergy uh, or a rash, right? And that opens the door. And so when the doors open, we say, would you like to be part of this family? Maybe we can help you. We, we do biometric screenings for every employee. We tell them what their A1C is. And, um, you know, we look at their BMI and we, they see it. We don't have to tell them. But as you know, if everyone is overweight, you don't feel overweight. If everybody's smoking, you don't feel like you're doing something wrong. But if your health is starting to go, then you get worried. And so we have a nicer way of saying it than fat, fatty. Mm -hmm. We do. Do you ever encounter, there are all these health approaches, Atkins and all this, do you ever, ever approach, uh, encounter these different approaches, or it's simply a matter if you're going to have lots of good pomegranates and people will be healthier? Do you... No, no. Uh, <laughs> we, we teach everyone at, in all of the businesses, including all the children at our health care centers at, at the schools, nutrition. Mm -hmm. And uh, we teach them that carbs are bad, especially if they're sugary carbs. And we teach them that they need vegetables, you know, the basics, what Dari Mastafarian talks about, and we all know uh, that you want vegetables, nuts, um, fruit in your diet. You want to keep the flesh foods down to a minimum. And um, we teach basic nutrition that way. 
instead of saying you can't do this, you can't do that. And every diet, everyone has their own health coach that comes to the clinic, assigned to them, that gives them their personalized exercise program and their personalized uh, nutrition program so that they don't follow in a group way, they follow what, what's good mm -hmm. for them. Yeah. So Stacy Chang, who runs the Design Institute for Health, he led the world, the global practice for IDEO. And in all of his work, he came across, he said, the one key thing that we can do is to educate the eldest female child of every family if we want to fundamentally turn this situation around. So I'm curious if you're seeing that, if you're doing that, what impact you're seeing with that? Well, our philosophy is that we have to get them very young. So we start in preschool with healthy food. And um, so far, I've only had one family leave because there were no nachos on the menu. But uh, it takes a little while, and then they're into it. And then they, they really want that healthy food. So, uh, and also, we have the Soldiers of Change, which are in, it's a uh, 10th grade class that you can take. And it is amazing how it's changed. Um, it used to be, uh, among the people that I know, that if you had stress and you needed to see a therapist, that that was a, neg a negative thing in your life and you didn't want people to know about it. But the children that I encounter at our schools are standing in line to see the psychiatrist and the psychiatric social workers. They have group therapy. Maybe because the stress is so intense. I don't know, Richard, are you hearing anything about this, that kids are more open to therapy, um, it's just a phenomenon. And it's harder with the older people in the plants and so forth to admit that they need this. So we give them stress reduction, breathing techniques, uh, mindful meditation classes. But their children are coming in for the therapy that we offer at the clinics. And look at the stress of living under the threat of immigration. Our employees are all legal, but there is someone in that house or more that isn't. And they're terrified because if grandma gets deported, they won't be able to work anymore. And every time a dad is picked up, it's months of the children crying and sleeping with their parents every night out of fear. So I'm happy that therapy is a, is a thing that's working. Uh, let's go over here. While we, the mic migrates, um, let me ask you about the pharmacy. Well, you haven't talked about the pharmaceutical piece of this. Yeah, so we give free. Uh, most of the meds are free. I mean, if you have an exotic condition, no, probably. But um, we have our own pharmacy. You get it right there and then, because they used to have to drive an hour to get to a pharmacy. It's so rural. Um, so that was a big help in adherence to taking your medicine. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Christy Vo. I'm the medical director of uh, behavioral, telebehavioral health for Children uh, Hospital of Philadelphia. Wonderful talk. Your life story is amazing and all the work that you do. I love to hear that you're incorporating a lot of mental wellness and um, mental resources for your employees and their families. I have uh, two questions. One question is, Considering that uh, you mentioned the retention of your physician or recruitment in general is hard, have you considered telemedicine? Uh, and another is uh, for a for an expiring entrepreneur uh, and being a woman in business. What do you? What are some of your advice that you would give? And, and there are talks, there are in discussion with the women in leadership that uh, when when you want to be successful, you have to be like a man, talk like a man, all that all those things, but then they also emphasize that the value that women bring to uh, team building and cohesiveness and, and, the, and what we can bring to uh, empathize with the company, all, that, all those things that builds a company better. So what's your thought on the two sides of the coin? I'm so confused. Well, I don't look like a man. <laughs> um, I'm gender blind when I hire people. I just want the best possible person. Uh, what was the first question? I'm also Te old, so I forgot the first. Telemedicine. Telemedicine. We have um, rooms within the plants and in the orchards that people can go to so they don't even have to come to the clinic to talk to a doctor. So we've done that. Uh, we have 24-7 where we work with an outside. Uh, I'm looking at Larry because he knows uh, I don't want to give misinformation. But we, w we have a 24-7 hotline that people can call. So it's a service that we, w that we use. 
and so telemedicine, of course, is part of the future, for sure. Maybe one more. I see somebody in the far back there. You're together, okay. We can be. Um, so rates of valley fever, which is a soil-borne uh, respiratory infection that folks get, they're particularly high in Kern County, highest in the country, I believe. And yes. um, as you may know, dust storms in the Southwest have gone up by 240%. And I'm wondering if you are looking at valley fever and other climate-related health issues. Of course. Um, you probably never heard of valley fever. It's, it's only in Arizona and uh, the Central Valley of California, and it's a spore that goes into your lungs. It's pretty much incurable. We have not seen a rise of valley fever in our clinics. Um, there is a new patch that's come out about a year ago, and it will tell you if you've ever had it, um, but I don't know what good that is. Uh, but it, it is an occasional thing. It's not really an epidemic. You know, we had a drought for a long time, but it rained um, last year a lot. So uh, the ground is better for that sort of thing. But it, it's, it's not as big as you may have heard. But if you get it, it's bad. But there's not much you can do about it because it's in the dry soil. And if you're in a, a, a sandstorm, you have to get out of the way if you possibly can. Yeah. It's, uh, I think a few things I've noticed in the last few years about you. One, we never used to talk about valley fever spores 10 years ago. <laughs> like the amount of knowledge you've actually acquired in the last 10 years is actually very impressive. Thank uh, you. <laughs> second, just how many pieces there are to this thing you've done. Like it's not just one effort, one program. It's, it's dozens and dozens of interlocking programs, which is really what society is. Society is a network of relationships and you've created a network. And then the final thing to be said, if anybody's thinking of doing this with their spare billion, um, <laughs> this has totally worked for Linda, in my observation. She's just glows every time she, and every time she gets to talk about this. So I encourage you to do more of it in public. Thank you, Linda Rezin. Thank you.